to share a couple things real quick. Uh, uh, we had a clothing giveaway here yesterday, and I, I believe, I don't know if anybody counted, but I think we had about 20 or 25 people come and get, uh, get clothes. And so I want to thank everybody that, that either donated or came out and helped us yesterday. Thanks, Debbie, for bringing breakfast. I had it for dinner, too, last night. So. <laughs> <laughs> she gave me the leftovers, so I got to do that. But uh, we also had a few ladies go down to Butler Springs to the Ladies' Day uh, retreat yesterday as well. And so, uh, anyway, I uh, also wanted to thank everybody. Um, this week we'll be taking uh, items we collected for House Mill Christian Assembly and Butler Springs Christian Camp. We appreciate all those that brought in donations. Uh, one thing I can say about this church, and uh, I've said it more than once, and me and Cheryl's had conversations about this church is always good about um, donating and giving things and, and more than we need. Uh, I know they took a bunch of socks down yesterday to, to the ladies uh, retreat that they collected. And so uh, I just appreciate everybody the generosity that you all show uh, when we have uh, things that we collect. So keep that in mind, uh, probably next month when we'll be doing the baby bottles for Elizabeth Hope, <laughs> we'll give you something else to, to collect uh, money for. But uh, I believe we, last year, I can't remember now, but it seemed like we had a, raised $1,000 or pretty close to that last year with the baby bottles. you remember, Raymond? I don't remember. But anyway, it was, it was more than we had the year before. So uh, we'll be, probably be doing that in June. Uh, but appreciate uh, your all's generosity. Uh, today we're going to continue our series uh, through uh, the book of Galatians called There's No Other Gospel. And once again, I have a, I have a typo in my, my sermon outline. Uh, your sermon outline, if you have it, says May 8th. Well, today's the 15th, so uh, I, I then printed them off where I realized I put the wrong date on there. See, I'm a week behind for some reason. But hopefully this week I'll get, get back on, the, on track, so uh, I apologize for that. So I don't want to confuse you and think you're the eighth. If you're like me, I'm having trouble keeping track of what day it is here lately. Uh, but anyway, we are uh, in the book of Galatians, and today's message I've entitled Even Brothers Fight. Anybody in here have a brother that they fought with on a regular basis? Um, I didn't have a brother, I had a sister, but me and her <laughs> fought quite a bit. Uh, most of the time it was verbal, sometimes it was physical. Uh, uh, and uh, so we used to, you know, we were only a grade apart, about, eight, uh, about 18 months, 20 months in, in age, so uh, uh, we fought quite a bit. Uh, we don't fight as much anymore, but we still uh, aggravate each other quite a bit, uh, uh, making fun of each other, teasing each other. Now it's, it comes in the form of sending text messages to each other about something. But uh, anyway, we know what it's like to have uh, sibling altercations and, and have fights uh, with your brothers or with your sisters. Uh, usually the interesting thing about uh, having siblings is you don't mind picking on them, but you don't want anybody else picking on them, and so you're quick to defend them if, if that comes up. But today, the, the sibling rivalry we're looking at is not uh, physical brothers, it's spiritual brothers. And, and in Galatians 2, Paul talks about having a uh, difference with... Uh, Paul, or with Peter or Cephas, um, and that's kind of what uh, the headline of the text. Now, they didn't get in a physical altercation, but basically Paul called, called Peter out for, for uh, some hypocrisy that he was doing. Uh, of course, there's another scripture uh, in the text where, where Paul and Peter got into a disagreement uh, over who to take on a mission trip with them, if you, if you remember that. But anyway, so obviously Paul wasn't afraid to confront people uh, when they did something wrong, which a lot of his letters, uh, he does do that, but he also did that in person. But anyway, sometimes even in a church setting, brothers and sisters disagree. Uh, now, in this room today, I could bring up any number of topics that none of us would agree or have the same opinion on. We all have different opinions. We have different, you know, as, as elders and deacons, sometimes we can have disagreements on how to handle things or what to do. It's not uncommon to have disagreements. We have disagreements uh, with our spouses, with our children uh, on things. The good thing about being a parent is you're the boss, so uh, uh, you're always right even when you're wrong, so that, I guess that's good. But, but as a husband, I'm, I'm wrong even when I'm right. I don't know if anybody else says that. Oh, Cheryl's up in here today, so I've got to be good about what I say. But, we don't have fights anymore, we have disagreements. 
But, <laughs> but anyway, it's just part of being around each other. And it's part of, you know, you spend enough time with someone, you're, you're going to get on each other's nerves, or, or you're still going to have differences of opinions. And so we see this coming in, in into the church. In Galatians, we come across a, a unique text where Paul and Peter had a disagreement, uh, or Paul confronted him about Peter and his hypocrisy uh, and holding a bad example. And again, this goes back to the Jewish and Gentile issue. Uh, Paul, in, in his letters, always calls Peter Cephas. Cephas is the Hebrew version uh, of Peter, and, and Peter is the Greek version, uh, but both being rock, if you remember, uh, Jesus telling Peter, uh, on this rock I will build my church, uh, which is, was kind of a, a play on words. But our, but our text today comes from Galatians chapter 2, verses, 20, verses 11 through 21, and we're going to see this text where Paul is, uh, calls out Peter for his hypocrisy, and then he gets into uh, some other issues uh, and the importance of seeing that, that, that there's a, a, a different way of doing things. But what can we learn from this text today? The first thing is, don't be a hypocrite. Now, I know we throw the word hypocrite around a lot, uh, especially in church circles. I'm sure if someone has told you in your lifetime that they didn't go to church because the church was full of hypocrites. Anybody ever heard somebody say that? Well, you can say, well, there's always room for one more uh, if you want to come with me. But, but the reality is the church doesn't hold all the hypocrites. Uh, hypocrites are everywhere. Hypocrites are at Applebee's or at Walmart or at Kroger or in the schools or where you work. Hypocrite is an individual trait. It's not just people who go to church and call themselves Christians. But, you know, sometimes Christians can be hypocritical, but everybody can be hypocritical. And so we need to, to be careful how we use that word, but at the same time, we don't want to be labeled a hypocrite. Uh, if you look at the first uh, three verses of Galatians chapter 2 in our text, is here where we see this account. It says, and this is Paul talking, he says, When Cephas or Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, was led astray. So Paul calls out Peter for he's hanging out and eating with the Gentiles, and all of a sudden when James and some of the other Jewish Christians show up, all of a sudden he backs up and, and acts like he doesn't, doesn't want anything to do with them because he doesn't want to be... Uh, labeled or have problems with his Jewish brothers and sisters. And, and Paul's just saying simply, you know, you're being a hypocrite, you know. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't separate one from the other. Because, okay, and he'll get into this, and we've already gotten this a little bit, where, hey, God doesn't show favoritism. God, God is just as much the God of the Gentiles as he is the Jews. But yet Peter at this time still had a little bit of an issue with this, you know, he didn't know, he wanted to uh, kind of, I don't know if he was being a people pleaser or what the issue was, but not only was Paul, Peter being a hypocrite, he was, uh, he was uh, influencing other people to do the same. And as a matter of fact, uh, Paul specifically says, you know, other Jews were joining you in this hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray by your actions. So again, when we do things, it can affect other people. We can influence other people negatively just as we can positive. But this is exactly what Paul is calling Peter out for because he was being hypocritical. Uh, he wasn't practicing what he preached. And if we want to have good relationships with fellow Christians, you can be hypocritical. Now, hypocrite comes from the Greek word uh, which means actor, uh, uh, pretending to be someone else or pretending to be something you're not. You could, might remember back in... Uh, Greek theater or Greek days that people in a play would play multiple characters. Uh, you know, there might be several people in, in the play, or, or and, but they would play multiple characters. And so in order to know the difference, they would simply put on a different mask. And so that's where that word comes from, is putting on these different faces or masks to play a character. But in the sense of being you, it's pretending to be something you're not. Well, when I'm around, and that's exactly what Peter was doing. Well, when I'm around the Gentiles, I'm going to act like them and accept them. But, oh, here comes my Jewish uh, brothers, brothers and, uh, and I so, oh, I better back away from them and act like I'm a Jew again. You know, he was pretending to be one thing around a certain group and not the other. And we can all be guilty of that. In a sense, we can pretend to be something we're not or be someone we're not around a certain crowd. And I've been guilty of that. We all have. We want 
Uh, whether that's we're wanting to impress people or please people, we can sometimes do that. Uh, you know, that's something I've struggled with. Uh, and, and we all can struggle with that. You know, when we're at church and we're around our Christian brothers and sisters, you know, we, 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 we want to be Christian and act like Christians, but then when we go to work or go hang out with our friends, you know, we might pretend to be something else. And basically, this is what Peter was doing. But the problem was, it wasn't just Peter doing this. He was influencing other people to do this. And we need to be careful that we don't do that, especially with the world watching, lost people. You know, we want to be Christians, but we also want to be real and sincere and honest and authentic in our faith and in our relationships with other people. You know, we don't want to come across it as one thing or another uh, to people. And you might remember the story that Jesus told about the, the speck or the plank in your eye. Remember that parable or the story that Jesus told in Matthew 7? And he says, how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So again, to paint this picture is you're, you're pointing out a speck of solidness in someone's eye when you've got a big huge two by four hanging out of your eye. And Jesus said, hey, work on your own self first and then you will be able to help this person who has much less of a problem. But isn't that funny how we do that? We, we will ignore our own sin or, or bad attitudes or bad behaviors and point out something from somebody else that's a lot less severe than what we're doing. And we don't want to be that. Jesus says you're being a hypocrite. You're pretending to be something you're not. And so we, we need to understand this. And, and I want to make it clear to everybody, you know, that we all have our own struggles. We all, we don't know people's situations. Now certainly we want to hold each other accountable as brothers and sisters in Christ. But we don't want to be hypocritical about it. You know, we need to be honest and open about our own uh, struggles or our own things that we're dealing with. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's easy to focus on other people's problems and not deal with our own. That's how a lot of times people avoid their problems is by focusing on other people. But we need to take care of ourselves. And that's exactly what Peter needed to do in this situation. You know, he needed to accept his brothers and sisters that were Gentiles, but he also needed to let the Jewish Christians, James and those others, see that, hey, I'm accepting them. But instead, he did the opposite, and he negatively influenced other people to do the same thing. So as Christians, we need to be careful that we are not hypocritical in our actions or our lifestyle or our behaviors. The second thing I think we can learn from this story of the dis you know, this disagreement between Peter and Paul is to remember that you're justified by faith, not works. Now, if you noticed this morning when you came in, we, that was on our sign. And I don't know uh, how poor I knew I was preach on this. Did you come up with this, Raymond, or was that not right? I, I know he was out of But anyway, I thought, well, that, that's a God thing because she doesn't really know what I'm preaching on this morning. So, but, but Paul gets in next after calling out Peter. He gets into this, you're justified by your faith, not works, which, which was a big issue. Because the Old Testament, the Jewish tradition uh, of, of salvation was based a lot on your works. In other words, you know, you took the lamb and, and, and sacrificed it. You did this. You did that. You had all these rituals and traditions and all of it was things you did. And you weren't having your sins forgiven. You were just simply covering them for that year until the next year. But it was based a lot on do's and don'ts and keeping the laws and doing all this. Well, when Jesus came and died on the cross and resurrected and established the church, we moved away from that, and our salvation is based on faith and the love in Jesus Christ. But let's look at our text. And this is what Paul said. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth are not sinful Gentiles. I know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. In other words, you can keep the law all day long. It's not going to save you. You know, you're just wasting your time. Number one, we're not under the old law anymore. We're under a new covenant. But number two, if you're just doing all these things to keep the law, uh, you're not really, you're just spinning your wheels, you're just wasting your time because we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message, not the law. Uh, and so Peter or Peter was not living this way. Paul was calling him out on that. 
Our faith in Jesus Christ is not only what saves us, but it's what sustains us in right relationship with God. You know, the law didn't die for our sins. The law doesn't cover our sins. The law doesn't make us holy or righteous under the new covenant. It's only through Jesus Christ. And the thing to keep in mind is, Paul called out Peter and the others for being hypocrites by justifying their hypocrisy by the works of the law instead of faith in Jesus, which they were supposed to be preaching anyway. And again, the message has to be said that being a Jew didn't make you more saved than being a Gentile. And, and the thing about that is today, we are not better than anyone else because we're, we're, we're because of our last name or the things we've done or how long we've been in church or because of all the Christian things we do. Our being right with God is simply through faith in Jesus Christ and nothing to do with anything that we can do. We talked about this in Sunday school a little bit. You know, we are holy because He is holy. We are righteous uh, because He is righteous. Not because of anything we have done, not because of anything we will do. There's not enough Hail Marys in the world to do to make us right with God. There's not enough service hours to do to make us right with God. You, know, you can come up here in the Baptist and get baptized every day. Nothing we do is going to save us. Only Jesus saves us. It's 100% by His work and nothing to do with our work. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot earn our salvation. And yet, many times, even today, even though we're not dealing with this Jewish-Gentile issue, and we don't deal with the old law, we still, sometimes a lot of Christians get caught up on keeping uh, the do's and don'ts. You know, uh, if I do this, I'm a Christian. If I don't do this, and we get into this list of do's and don'ts and, and traditions and all these things, and we miss the point that Jesus alone saves us. And we cannot earn it, and we don't deserve it, and none of us are better than the others. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian longer than me. It doesn't matter that I'm a preacher, happen to be a preacher, and you're just a, a church member. We're all, we all serve the same God, and we're all, uh, you know, they say the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all in the same boat. And look at Paul's words to the Romans in chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. He reminds the Roman Christians that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we now have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Do you understand? We, the blood of Jesus Christ, saved us and justified us, made us right before God. It paid the penalty for sin and the wrath and condemnation of hell. And so not only does it save us in Jesus Christ, but it also saves us from the punishment we deserve. And we always need to keep that in mind. Everyone, no one deserves it, but God offers it to anyone. Don't ever think someone is too lost or someone is too evil. And I know there's lots of evil in this world and there's lots of people that do evil. Now, years ago, I used to say this. I remember, so you, how many of you in here remember uh, Jeffrey Dahmer? Don't go out to eat with him. And anyway, <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer obviously did some horrible things. As a matter of fact, he was killed in prison. You know, he was beat to death. But while he was in prison, he, he became a Christian. He got saved. Now, I don't know all the details. I've just read different you know, articles and stories on it. And some people would criticize that and say, he did so many awful things, yet how could God save him from all the things he did? But that's the mystery and majesty of God. None of us deserve, you know, I don't deserve heaven any more than Jeffrey Don or anybody else. But he accepted the same God and the Savior and was baptized into uh, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus for the remission of sins, just like I was. And so he has a right to that just as much as I do. Just because I didn't do some of the heinous acts he did doesn't make me more, more of a Christian than him or, or better off than him. And, and that's just one example, but there's people all around us sometimes. I, I know we're guilty of it, even if we want to admit it, we'll look at people and think, uh, you know, I'm better off than them, I'm better than them, or, or they're such an awful person. But, but God died for them just as much as he died for me and you. We need to remember God loves us all and he died for everyone, even those that sometimes seem unlovable. The third thing I think we can learn from this story is you have to die to self. One of the hardest things to do when you become a Christian is to surrender all of yourself to God. A lot of people want enough Jesus to, to be saved and not go to hell, but they don't want enough Jesus to, set, to tra transform or change their life. And that's where the problem is. You know, we don't want to go to hell. We want to go to heaven. Uh, but do we really understand that salvation and, and the Holy Spirit coming into our life should transform and change us? 
I'm not saying that it's an instantaneous overnight thing. It takes time to grow and mature your faith. When you become a Christian, you're literally a newborn baby in Jesus. You're an infant. But at some point, you should begin growing. God may change and take away some of those desires you have or, or help you work on some of the things you've struggled with in your life. But what the hardest thing to do, but the necessary thing to do, is we have to die to our own desires. And our life becomes about God and not us. This part of the text has one of the, probably one, one of the most famous or common verses that we all know in it. But look at this next section. It says, Paul says, but if, but if it's seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I would really be a lawbreaker. For the, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. And then here's the verse. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We used to sing this song in church camp, this verse in church camp. Does anybody remember singing this song? I've been crucified in Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ live up. And on, on Sunday. All right. Well, the point being is I remember singing this song as a kid at church camp, and maybe we even sang it at vacation Bible school. But it really didn't, you know, it was cool when it rhymed, but I really didn't talk about older understood what Paul was telling the other people here. You know, basically he's saying Paul was crucified with Christ, and it's not Paul living anymore, but it's Christ living through me. And this life I'm now living in my body, I'm living by faith in Jesus. I'm not living it by, by Paul, I'm not living it by the law, I'm not living it by being a Jew. I'm living it by Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. This is a powerful verse. That's why uh, it sticks out and why it's popular because in that little one verse there, verse 20, Paul is explaining how God comes in and changes your life, but you have to die to yourself. Peter obviously still had some human flesh that was living out in him or he would have been separating himself from the Gentiles when the Jews came along. And, and, and so we need to understand that if we're going to live for Jesus, if we're going to preach Jesus, if we're going to be a part of Jesus' body of the church, and we need to act like it, but we need to get less, less of ourselves involved and more Jesus filling us up. It's exactly what John the Baptist said. I must decrease, he must increase. You know, John the Baptist had a ministry. He came to prepare the way for the Messiah. And then when the Messiah came, it was time for him to step back. And that's exactly what he did. It's kind of the same way when you become a Christian. Every day we should try to fill our lives more and more with Jesus and less and less of ourselves. Because, let's be honest, I've lived long enough and some of you are older than me and some of you are younger than me, than me but the bottom line is, is when Jason's in charge, things don't turn out very good. <laughs> when I try to do my own will, things my way, it, it's a disaster. I, I don't make the right choices, I don't make the right decisions, I have the wrong attitude, and, and all of these things. And, and, and life is hard enough, is it not? I mean, our life is filled with pain and suffering and and treated unfairly and, and all these things and, and it's easy to focus on the negativity but when we try to control every little thing we try to, to tell God what to do and how to do things we are failing miserably and we have to surrender not partial surrender not surrender to God when it's convenient or we want out of trouble we want something but simply surrender to God and just like I shared this verse at my dad's funeral in Job Job says, naked I came into the world, and naked I will leave this world. But what did he say? Uh, I can't remember all, all of it all four before, but he said, Let, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, or, uh, in other words, you know, it, it rains on the just and the unjust. You know, everything in this world happens to good and bad people, but no matter what happens, I'm going to praise the name of the Lord. And that's what we need to have in our life. We need to have this attitude that, that I'm going to die to myself and, and let Christ live in me, and, and I'm going to crucify the old self, the hypocrisy, trying to earn my way to heaven, trying to save myself, and I'm going to leave it up to Christ alone. We even sang a song, In Christ Alone. In Christ Alone, I put my trust. You didn't know this was going to be a musical song today, but it is. Uh, maybe I should hire a singer. But <laughs> look at what Paul said uh, in Romans chapter 6. He says, for we, if we have been united with him in his death, like he is, in other words, we've, we've uh, been buried with him in baptism, or we've died to ourselves, and we've raised a new creature, we will certainly also be united with him in the resurrection like he is. In other days, he's going to resurrect these bodies when we're going to be with him in heaven. Verse 6, for we know that the old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, 
that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Yet so many of us continue to live like slaves, slaves to this world, slaves to our schedule, slaves to our own struggles. But do you understand when you became a Christian, Jesus died for you, you've been set free from sin? So stop living like a prisoner. We need to live like free men and women in Christ that you freed you from that. And that's an encouraging thing for us to know and realize that we need to die to ourselves and live in Christ. Which brings me to my final point. Christ gives us grace and righteousness. Christ gives us grace and righteousness. He offers us grace. And he offers us right standing with God. And Paul puts this in one simple verse at the end of this slide. He says in verse 21 of chapter 2, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness can be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. We need to keep in mind that Jesus didn't die for the law. He didn't die for, for the Gentiles or the Jews. He died for everyone. And the law is not going to save you. Coming to church every week is not going to save you. Calling yourself a Christian is not going to save you. Being baptized is not going to save you. Only your faith in Jesus Christ is going to save you. It's grace. That's what grace is. Get, getting something you don't deserve. That's what God's grace is. Some people call it unmerited favor or whatever you want to call it. But grace is God offering me salvation that I don't deserve and paying the penalty for me um, that I can't pay myself. But if we don't accept that, then Christ died for nothing. And if we're living our life for Jesus is the Lord of our life, then Christ's death means nothing to you. And we have to live lives that our Savior, Jesus Christ, not only died for our sins, but He's alive. And He lives forever. And we're going to live forever with Him if we continue to have faith in Him. And we continue to allow Him to work in our lives. The law doesn't bring grace. Being Jew doesn't bring grace. Being a Christian doesn't bring grace. Only Jesus Christ. And only through Jesus Christ can we be right. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to be found in wrong standing with God. You know, Paul closes out his thought today with his Jewish brothers saying Jesus Christ died for nothing if it wasn't to offer you grace and righteousness. And you need to focus on that. But Paul also reminds Romans the same thing. It almost seems like Paul uh, shared similar thoughts with the Galatians that he did with the Romans because all of my, most of my scriptures today have also been from Romans. But this is what Paul said in Romans 3. He said, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When it, when, it, when it comes down to it, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nothing we can do to earn it, nothing we can do to get it is a gift from Jesus Christ. And that righteousness comes through our faith. We have not only have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and died for our sins and resurrected and He's our Lord and Savior, but we have to have faith in that. Faith is belief in action, putting what we believe in action and living that out in our lives. You know, instead of worshiping the law or worshiping the prophets like the law of the Old Testament did, they missed the point. They missed Jesus. And sometimes we can get caught up, you know, we worship the Restoration Movement or we worship the Church of Christ or we worship... Our, our, our traditions, or we worship this, we worship that. And we can say, well, that's, I'm not worshiping that. But the truth is, what is worship? worship? Worship is what you show worth to and value to. That's really what worship is. <laughs> so if you're putting all your worth and value in to those things and not the gospel, not Jesus Christ, then you miss the point of being a Christian. And Paul was teaching this lesson to Galatians through the example of Peter that Peter was missing the point of being a Christian. That Jesus died for all of us, whether we're Jews or whether we're Gentiles, and the law did its part, and now Jesus has did his part. So we don't no longer need to keep the law in that sense. You know, because Jesus fulfilled the law. Now it's not about religion and, and rituals and traditions, it's about relationship with Jesus Christ and being obedient to him. I'm going to close my message here now, this morning, at this point. But I love this little thing here, Dean. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> because the bottom line is we're going to have differences. We're going to have differences of opinions. Uh, I talked last week about common ground. But the point I want to leave us with today is, is that we need to live for God and let him live in us. If we're living for God and Christ is living in us and living out in our actions and behavior, 
uh, you know, our life is going to be a lot better, it's going to be a lot different, and we're not going to get caught up on all these, these arguments, meaningless arguments that, that don't mean anything. And I think it's important for us to, to see that even though we may disagree or have different points of view, somebody, let's never forget who we belong to. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's not be trying to earn our way to heaven, but let us have faith in Jesus Christ and allow him to work in our lives. I'm going to offer the invitation now. Steve, uh, our praise team is going to come forward and we're going to share a, a song uh, of invitation. And if anybody here needs to respond to invitations, whether you have never been saved, you want to recommit your life, if you want to put down roots in this church and place your membership, whatever your needs, uh, I'll be down front. If you're able and willing, if you stand with me, uh, we'll send our song in the city.